All right. Well, good morning. It is a sunny, cold January day today, though not as cold as some of the days we've had. Um, so it's not torture to be outside. Uh, thanks for joining us today for Bible study. Um, we are in coming up on the second Sunday after Epiphany. So we're going through that season of Christ being revealed um, uh, and uh, just celebrating those stories. And for this coming Sunday, we get to hear about um, Jesus's first sign, kind of his way of uh, coming out to the world that he is more than just the son of a carpenter and Mary. Um, and so we'll get into that today. Um, no one's on yet, should I keep going anyway? Yeah, we're a minute in. Okay, alrighty. Well, we'll start with prayer. Lord God, source of every blessing, you showed forth your glory and led many to faith by the works of your Son, who brought gladness and salvation to his people. Transform us by the spirit of his love, that we may find our life together in him. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Excuse my cough. Our gospel lesson is uh, from the Gospel of John in the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. Turning water to wine at the wedding of Cana is described as the first of Jesus' signs. Throughout, or through many such epiphanies, Jesus reveals that he bears God's creative power and joyful presence into the world. So here's our gospel. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> Again, if you're just joining us, we are in the second Sunday of Epiphany and our gospel this Sunday is from John chapter two, the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine. Yes, that would save us a lot on our communion bill. Yeah, it would. So, well, scholars of the Gospel of John often speak of the many layers or levels of meaning in his verses. And this story of the wedding in Cana and Galilee is no exception. Many of the words and details are laden with symbolic meaning, which the faith community would hear and understand. The first one is on the third day. In verse 1, the resurrection of Jesus came on the beginning of the third day after the cross. Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. In verse 4, for Jesus, hour in John is the suffering and death on the cross. And then in verse 6, we find the six stone water jars. The number six indicates incompleteness. The stone jars were used for the Jewish rites of purification, yet the contents of the jar were incomplete and in inadequate for the occasion. The new wine from Jesus is a choice wine, suggesting that the new revelation of God in Jesus is the fullness of God's revelation. And then the wedding feast. The wedding feast is used many times in the Old and New Testament as a symbol of the kingdom of God. And the relationship of the bride and the groom is used as a description of the relationship of God to God's people. We see that in our reading in Isaiah 62, which should be our Old Testament reading for this Sunday. So the question is, what is the significance of the use of symbolism in the Gospels? Well, I think symbolism gives uh, further layers of meaning um, and also 
um, I think, meaningfulness to people. I think sometimes symbols speak to us in a way um, more deeply than maybe straight conversation does. I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think it's even worse than the Gospel of John because in the words that he uses in Greek, quite often they'll have multiple meanings. Yes. And so not only do you have the symbolism, but you have the possibility of multiple meanings as he um, speaks. But I think the symbolism is helpful because it is sort of like how we use stained glass windows in church to tell the story is mm -hmm. for everybody, they learn and they hear differently. Yeah. And so sometimes the symbols come across a lot clearer mm -hmm. than the clear word. Yeah. And so it, it's another way of teaching. Yeah, well, like for some people, uh, the, the symbol of Lamb of God is very deeply meaningful to them, you know, mm -hmm. or other symbols like that can really um, kind of capture you um, in your faith and your imagination. Yeah. So in what way is this helpful or is it confusing? It can be very confusing especially if you are not of that culture of that time yes. because you don't necessarily know the context um, and the stories behind it and so you have to you have to work for it you have to dig you have to study um, and we're not always excited about having to do that we would like to just have that meaning and then keep moving and not necessarily have to spend the time to uh, dig into the culture and into those deeper meanings and those connections um, though that's the more complete and respectful thing to do. Mm -hmm. And especially, yeah, it's really hard if you aren't part of the culture. I think about when I try to talk to the kids about things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> and none of them watched the Arsenio Hall show in the late 80s and Imagine early 90s. Imagine that. So they don't get those. <laughs> um, well, and so the symbolism can be confusing, but mm -hmm. in many ways it also can expand our understanding. Yes. Yes, um, I had a fellow pastor um, that I worked with for a while in a community um, who was from Germany. And he talked about his struggle to understand um, our figures of speech and our symbols. Because he said, for an example, he said, you know, in Germany, if somebody's a really good friend who you can just rely on, trust, you say, uh, now there's somebody who I could steal horses with. Well, in Western part of the United States, stealing a horse was a hanging offense, you know, so it doesn't have the same meaning. Um, and I just found that really helpful for him to tell me about that because, yeah, we, we need to be aware and listening and learning. Well, the final verse of this lesson indicates that this miracle was first of Jesus' signs and revealed his glory. Um, yeah, this is not, this, this isn't really called a miracle, it's called a sign, a sign of who Jesus is. The Gospel of John has a series of seven signs, the number symbolic of completeness and wholeness. The signs or miracles of Jesus' ministry all point to Jesus and his identity as God's promised one. They serve to reveal the identity of Jesus to those who witness these events, which is what Epiphany is all about. It is about revealing Christ for who he is. So in this season of Epiphany, the Church of God looks for the ways God is revealed in the world. Just as the star of Bethlehem led the wise men to the Christ child, and the voice was heard at Jesus' baptism proclaiming Jesus as God's Son, with whom God is well pleased, so the signs in John's Gospel point to Jesus. They are written and revealed in order to lead to faith. God's glory is revealed in mystery. The story of the changing of water into wine at Cana concludes with the good news. And his disciples believed in him. That's verse 11. Everything in the story, the empty jars, the miraculous transformation of water into wine, the hints of Jesus' hour, the context of the wedding feast, all are included to elicit faith and to reveal Jesus as the promised Messiah. So how do we experience God's revelation today? So we have the reading of scripture. Mm -hmm. The Bible is presented to our kids at Sunday school and confirmation for, a, for the purpose of having, them be, having the word of God revealed to them. I think it's also revealed in in each other and how we interact with one another, how we 
make it part of our lives. And so that's mm -hmm. an important way that we have God revealed to us today. Mm -hmm. Well, I think in just the experiences we have in life, um, you know, looking for the ways that God is at work, because God is, you know, and having an open mind and heart um, to see that. And God is revealed through other people, through experiences, just through a lot of things. Mm -hmm. God can be revealed in a sunrise, and God can be revealed in the kind words of another. But, well, which of the following phrases rings true? Seeing is believing, or believing is seeing? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Well, sometimes it's hard to to um, to believe things unless you see it, but other times it's it's hard to see things unless you believe they're actually there. Yes. Yes. And so it's it's a it's a little bit of both, I think. I think so too. I mean, I remember Thomas saying, "Look, I I won't believe unless I see Jesus and I touch the wounds on his hands." And I've always felt a lot of empathy for him because we want to see it we want to touch it then I can really believe but we do recognize that uh, faith is taking things um, that are unseen and trusting in it but we see the different people that come to Jesus for healing and believing mm -hmm. made them see Jesus and yeah. so it's that's the thing if they hadn't believed in him I mean they would have heard about him but they wouldn't have approached him or believed that he could heal him well, how does a person come to faith? How did you come to believe in Jesus? Well, I came the traditional Lutheran ways. Ooh. My parents made me. <laughs> I was going to say, thanks, Mom and Dad, for taking me to church and to Sunday school. Uh, but I suppose they made me. <laughs> but, you, know, it's, you know, it's a little bit different, I think, for many of us who are have been lifelong members, is that process of coming to faith is one of gradual coming to. Is, mm -hmm. You know, we start off as kids, and our, our parents make us go to church. Sometimes we want to go to church so we see our friends, but it's not something we go to because, you know, we've come to believe completely. And then we go through confirmation where, I don't know about you, but... I at least was not excited to be forced to sit for an hour and listen to a pastor every week. Um, but it's gradually over time that all those things that were taught me as a child mm -hmm. and as a youth have come to have meaning and to be part of what my life is. Mm -hmm. And so, I, you know, I'd like to say it's, I had that aha moment, but it's been every little thing that's been there that is... Done yeah, that. I think mine has been gradual with some aha moments along the way. Moments where all of a sudden I've realized, oh my goodness, I do have a sense of God's presence or I am being led to something. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I have known folks for whom uh, faith ha is an aha moment, a big one, um, and that has defined their lives ever since. Um, so I think everybody's story is just a bit different. Yeah, I still like the story we heard at the last youth gathering that... Um... There's a pastor who grew up, if I remember right, she grew up Hindu, and in college her friends invited her to go to the campus ministry, and she went, and there was no forcing of faith, nothing else, just free food and good conversation, and she was just so impressed with how welcoming these people were and how mm -hmm. open they were that she wanted to know more and gradually became a Lutheran pastor, and so, I mean, it comes to different ways. It does, and um, and I think everybody's story includes welcome and uh, relationship, because mm -hmm. we, you know, faith really that comes is. through relationship. Yeah, there really isn't any other way for it to happen. Um, I think that's why it's so important that we do establish those caring relationships with people, because that's how one of the big ways we experience God's presence. I keep thinking about poor St. Benedict doing everything he could to find faith as a hermit and mm -hmm. nobody would leave him alone. Mm -hmm. So he had to start a monastery. Yeah. Which was founded on hospitality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, now we come to the word among us, the second part. 
The students and the teacher in class were frustrated. The teacher had tried several different teaching methods to explain the important geometric formula, but without success. Students did not understand the concept. So the teacher had an idea. She asked the class to gather around her desk. She said, watch closely as she took three wooden blocks, formed them into a right angle triangle and, me triangle and measured each side. Then she took three other blocks of different lengths and did the same exercise, measuring, excuse me, measuring the lengths of the sides of the second triangle. She, excuse me. She moved over to the blackboard and wrote the formula once again, this time the measure, with the measurements of the two triangles. It was as if a light had turned on in the darkness of incomprehension. Now I get it, one of the students exclaimed. Experience led to comprehension. Seeing led to believing. Share others' examples where seeing leads to understanding. Hmm. Well, I think um, seeing people um, lovingly serve others, not for what they can get out of it, but just to be of service. I mean, seeing that and knowing that it's a faith that has led them to that place, I, you know, as a young person, I found that really powerful. Well, it's even more worldly. We are talking with a group yesterday about how the important, that masks work and how you learn that they work. And I was telling him that I learned that masks work from a oak tree. You know, at uh, basic training, almost every site has an oak tree about six feet outside the door of the gas chamber and you have to wear your mask and then you have to take it off to show that you could breathe before but not after but you had to be calm as you exited the building otherwise you found that oak tree and but they had us go in there and stand in tear gas for about a couple minutes and then they had to take the mask off so we learned that the mask actually was doing mm. what it said yikes you learned that it worked <laughs> So that was a heavy duty or mask? Yes, that was a much bigger mask. So anybody who complains about masks nowadays, I, I, it's like, these are so much simpler. Um, <laughs> so how is it true in our faith lives as well? Seeing leads to understanding. Yeah. Again, it's seeing, you know, people don't think it's important to be at church sometimes, but sometimes seeing people in church with you yeah leads you to understand that, you know, especially on those days where we're wondering why, and you see other people who find it important that they need to be there. And it makes you realize that this is... This does matter. This does matter. Definitely. Yeah, and I think um, when we see certain behaviors around us, that influences our behavior. Mm -hmm. And we see this all the time. And um, so what behaviors are we exposing ourselves to? What examples, mm -hmm. you know, are we opening up our lives to? I think about, you know, the different examples, you know, we have Martin Luther King Jr. Day coming up next week and, and just thinking about people willing to take their faith and be beaten and go to jail for it because they believe it so strongly. You know, I think at youth gathering, we hear examples of faith of pastors who are either um, harassed or imprisoned in the United States for taking their faith seriously of wanting to feed the hungry, care for the poor, yes. and the communities around them and the states around them would rather have the poor and the hungry seen someplace else. Mm -hmm. and, and to see them say that, no, this is something I have to do and are willing to take the extremes for it. You know, we see it. And examples of faith um, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer yeah you know being willing to risk everything and so so we have examples of faith that that guide us mm -hmm. and I think it's helpful for us to see uh, examples of faith not only in these great people who did amazing things but in just the regular people that we interact with you know oh you know Stan you know Stan you know and seeing Stan mm -hmm. living out that faith can be really inspiring. But yeah, a regular person like me can um, live a rich life of faith. Yeah, well, I think it's strange. The person I remember most from my church growing up was Mark, our 
janitor always being willing to stop and talk to us as we're roaming the church halls between the Sunday school or after confirmation and before youth group and that just always struck me and how always he was he treated us as though we were people yeah. and that even as youth and kids yeah. well I've talked before about Mr. Severson he was our Sunday school teacher for us kids who had already been confirmed and actually were still going to church and he just he took our questions seriously he didn't blow us off he didn't come with an agenda. He just wanted us to know Christ and listen to our questions. And we had good conversations, some of the best conversations as a young person. Um, and, and he just, he was just there, but he, it was powerful. Yeah. He showed up and he cared. So the next question is, what, ex what does the expression blind faith mean? Our, Sometimes you just have to take it on faith. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, you know, sometimes when you try new things, trying to make it work, or you're going to go meet with a new person that you want to talk to, it's sometimes just blind faith, trusting that God is with you, that you aren't alone as you make into the, make this step into a journey where you aren't sure where it's going to end up. Yeah, it's about trust. You know, whatever it is that you're facing, that there's a trust that it is, there's no promise it's going to be easy, but trust that, that you're accompanied and you're cared for, mm -hmm. you know. And I think uh, when my uncle and his family um, went to become missionaries in Malaysia, there was a lot of that because they didn't, you know, you don't necessarily know exactly what you're getting into. <laughs> and it was quite an experience for seven years. Um, but just, going out anyway you know mm -hmm. going for it i don't know the bugs alone would be a big issue for me all right i once was lost but now i'm found was blind but now i see how many of you started hearing that first song in your head these familiar words from the book hymn amazing grace capture the message of epiphany Epiphany is a time to look for Jesus, for God's presence. It is a time to lift up the experiences of God that lead to and deepen faith. It is a time for light to shine in the darkness of unbelief and incomprehension. It is a time of transformation. Where and when do you see and experience God's presence? You never know. It's kind of become a joke for me. You know, go to the grocery store, experience God. <laughs> I don't know why. Simple ones. You see it in the sunrises, I've been told, and in sunsets. Um, We're not morning people. <laughs> and, you know, I, I see it in my daughters. You know, and I see it in the people that we meet. Mm -hmm. and I think anytime you see somebody doing a loving act towards somebody else, mm -hmm. holding a door, um, helping somebody get something off a higher shelf, anything like that, it's, mm -hmm. it's sometimes simple things. And you know, and even online, you know, we we have such um, complaints and criticisms about online life well, for good reason. Um, but I've also seen amazing gifts of compassion. Um, you know, I'm, I belong to different groups and stuff on like Facebook just for fun stuff and I have seen such such compassion and patience and um, from people who probably will never meet and are on opposite ends of the world um, and that's that's wonderful yeah. uh, how might we look for God's presence during the coming week well, we get the confirmation students today. How might we see God's presence in our kids? And their love of snacks. <laughs> I think we're getting a little low, actually. And then, uh, you know, at church, you, know, you get to see everybody gathered around. And mm -hmm. We may not be able to do all the things we want to, but we can still see people. Yep. You got it. So there's different places you can see God's presence. Yeah, I mean, yeah, just about anywhere. 
I think a lot of time is having an open mind to see it. You know, you know watching the news this morning, you see um, there's a helicopter crash of a mm. medical helicopter. Oh. And everybody walked away. Oh, well, wonderful. And it's just amazing <gasps> to see the, how it hits and that, you know, it, you know, people can survive things. Oof. Uh, what does the hymn Amazing Grace mean to you? Yes, Mr. Music. <laughs> yes. This is for me. Yes. You know, the Amazing Grace is, is truly for me. It's not just a song that somebody wrote and sang years and years ago, but mm -hmm. it, these are still words that are meant for me to hear and for me to make my own. I've found comfort in those words many, many times. And there have been times when I have been sad or struggling or, you know, just in one of those hard times in life. And I'll find myself singing it to myself. Um, well, when the girls were little and I would sing to them as they were falling asleep, um, quite often, I mean, I didn't think about what I was going to sing, but quite often Amazing Grace was one of those things I would sing to them. Just because it is such a promise. So it's just a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was going to say, I'm also brought my laptop so I can check for comments too. It's one of the things I've noticed with my phone, I can't see comments as easily. So, I'm doing both. Okay, well, the next section here the story of the miraculous changing of water into wine at the wedding at Cana in Galilee is an epiphany story. And like most experiences of God's presence in our lives, there is an element of mystery in the experience. We don't know how Jesus turned water into wine. We don't know how a cross can be a sign of life, how dying can lead to rising, how Jesus can be truly God and truly human, how Christ can be both can be truly present in a morsel of bread and a sip from a cup, or how a motley group of sinners can be the body of Christ. We can't fully comprehend, but we see, and in seeing, we believe. What do you have trouble believing about Jesus Christ? Hmm. Well, it, I don't know, trouble in believing, but just struggle to understand um, the Trinity, you know, and Jesus' place within it. Um, you know, fully human, fully divine, but yet is God. I mean, that's just, it's a tough one to stretch your mind around. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Trouble believing? Oh, that, you know, sometimes it's hard to believe that God's love is, you know, he can see the people that do all the pain and suffering in the world. And, but I know that, you know, we've just talked about amazing grace. That's yeah. what it means. Yeah. But sometimes hard for me to understand. Yeah, when people, people who cause such pain and are just cruel in their hearts mm -hmm. um, and knowing that Jesus died for them, God loves them, God wants to claim them. And there's a part of us, I think, that just revolts against that idea. But then again, I think about my own daughters and what they'd have to do to make me revolt against them and not love them anymore. And yeah. I, then I can understand a little bit more, but yeah. Yeah, it's hard. Um, a pastor friend of ours, when we were out in North Dakota, excuse the expression, but she would say, uh, grace sucks. Because, I mean, we're grateful for it, it's awesome, but that also means it's applied to everybody else, whether we think they deserve it or not. And we don't get to be the ones to decide. Um, and that can be a bitter pill to swallow sometimes. Mm -hmm. But if you have something you have trouble believing about Jesus Christ, you know, feel free to message us if you don't want to put it in the comments or catch us after church or give us a call. Mm-hmm. Most of the time we can find answers or be confused together. <laughs> yeah, there we go. All right, just have a good conversation um, because we all have stuff. I mean, and, and just because we're pastors doesn't mean that we're just, you know, 100% on. You're not supposed to share that. <laughs> I think they figured it out. So, and then the next question is, when has it all made sense to you? Mm. I think it made the most sense when Sophia was born. Mm. 
to realize that you know there's something that you someone that you can love enough that you know sacrifice and everything makes sense yeah. that's beautiful baby um i think yeah there's for me it was also in her birth just because it had been such a struggle to get to have her and we had lost her older sibling and it was just she's just such a gift um, yeah and I think too um, there have been times when I'm in a place that just inspires awe where I just have such a strong sense of God and that it, it all just comes together um, it's been different places where I've experienced that. Mm -hmm. That's true. Camp, I remember one worship service, just seeing the deer watching us mm -hmm. as we're worshiping as though we weren't, we were just there, not something to be feared. Yeah. So what do you say to someone who has questions or doubts about their faith in Jesus? Join the group. Well, I think about you know, what did the people of um, Israel were called Israel, people who wrestle with God. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is what we're called to be, is somebody who keeps asking questions, keep trying to find understanding. And you have doubts throughout all the, all the disciples. I mean, we make doubting Thomas into a thing, but the week it's before, painful. all the disciples did this. All the other ten disciples said the exact same thing. Yeah when Jesus appeared to them is let me see your hands and your sides. Mm -hmm. So doubt is not doubt something is that not, is opposed yeah. to faith. No, it's not the opposite of faith. Doubt is a part of a faith life, mm -hmm. about growing in faith. Um, questions are important. I think, you know, in the Jewish tradition was that you would wrestle with scripture, you would debate with each other, and you would debate with God about stuff, and that was faithful. I was being faithful to the scriptures and faithful to God to just wrestle. And I'm sad that as Christians, we've lost a lot of that tradition out of which we've come. Um, I think there's some who have basically said, if you question anything, then you're not being faithful. Well, the opposite is true, really, in many ways. You know, Jesus talks about having faith like a child. And if you've ever had a kid, you know, the question is, why? Why? Mm -hmm. You know? It's questioning is something that is part of our faith. It's mm -hmm. part of what scripture tells us to do. And I mean, we see the examples in John in chapter three, when Nicodemus comes to him and comes to Jesus and has all these questions and Jesus may give him a runaround in the answers, <laughs> but he doesn't reject the no. questions. No. He challenges us and pushes us and, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, the questions or doubts are part of faith. If you, you know, I think everybody has questions or doubts. Mm -hmm. It's when you stop learning is when. Yeah. How can you grow in faith or in any sort of learning if you're not asking the questions, you're not digging deeper? You know? As you can tell, I like questions. Yeah. And arguing and figuring yeah. things out. Yeah. I just think it's funny, uh, the first sermon I ever preached, it was a youth Sunday in January um, for us to come back from college. And I think the gist of my sermon was that questions are a holy thing. You know, we never should stop asking our questions. Mm -hmm. There you go. And you know, that was one of the things I missed this year with worrying about COVID. And the past two years, worrying about COVID is doing the Ask the Pastor Sunday. So make sure we get that on the schedule this year. That's, I like having that scares questions. scares me a little. <laughs> questions are what inspires me. Yes. And so, and finding answers. Well, how about the questions like, why is the bathroom sink not working right? Don't know that one. Mm -hmm. We'll have to find the bathroom. Yeah. So. I like to give them a hard time. Okay. Thanks for joining us today um, and trying to dig in a bit to this, uh, the, 
wedding at Cana. I hope it has um, inspired some questions for you and some, some thinking about these things. Um, did you want to talk about our schedule? For yeah, this we week? have um, worship at Our Saviors at 9 o'clock. We are at yeah, 16, so we are at English at 8.30 and at St. Olaf at 10.30. As of now, there's still Sunday school at both at 9.30 at both sites. Um, though our COVID numbers are going up, so I encourage you to start wearing a mask a little bit more often. Yeah. Omicron's a little bit more, um, more contagious. It may be like a cold for most people, but watching the hospital numbers around Minnesota, they are going up. And it is in our community at watching the numbers. I know there's been a few meetings canceled because of lack of well people. So um, I ask you to take it seriously and be safe. And we're probably going to have to um, be more careful in worship again. We've mm -hmm. we've relaxed over this time, but I think we're going to have to start. It's come back, and so we have to yeah. start taking things a little more seriously. So we'll be talking with the council presidents about what we do. So, okay, well, let us end with prayer. O God of light, shine in the darkness of our world. Open our eyes to see your presence in our lives. Amen. Amen. Going to dig deeper, going to Isaiah 62, verses 1 through 5. And for the last word, look this week for signs of God's presence in your life. I hope you do discover signs of God's presence around you, because that's, that's a, a gift. And if you see something, share it in the comment section yeah. of this post. Always like to hear where we can find God. Absolutely. Well, again, thank you for being here. Hope you have a good Wednesday. So, God peace. Be with you.